Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center of Excellence for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Consultations Conference, Equity from the Start. My name is Nagar Zahiri, and I will serve as your session moderator. I am joined today by Cynthia Wellman, who will serve as our technical host. This session is being recorded. Transcription is available through the platform. And should you have any questions, please feel free to relay your questions in the chat. We will definitely have time at the end of the session for Q&A with the presenters. With that said, I'd like to now pass it over to our presenters for this session, Misty Cole and Tammy Hogsett, who will be conducting this workshop with the group today. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you, Nagar. We really appreciate that. And welcome. Uh, we are so glad to have you with us today. Uh, as Nagar said, uh, Tammy and I will be your facilitators for today, and we are incredibly honored to be in this space and to be able to talk about something that we have passionately pursued and researched for the past eight years. And having this opportunity to share it with all of you is humbling and quite an honor. So thank you for being here. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about creating opportunity, infant and early childhood, mental health consultation in Appalachia. And as we begin, we'd like to thank the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, Governor Mike DeWine and Lori Chris, Director of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for their support of the work that we do around the state of Ohio and for uh, continuing to ensure that that work gets done. So today we have just a couple of objectives in our time together. The first is to identify three unique characteristics of Appalachia. And uh, this is really a, an important issue for us as we've not seen Appalachia discussed often. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move in. But as we kind of dive into Appalachian region and Appalachian culture, we're hoping to be able to identify three unique characteristics. And then to tie this work together with the infant and early childhood mental health consultation, also identifying three ways that IECMHC has reduced Appalachian disparities and how we've seen that kind of um, manifest in the work that we do uh, in our region. So Ohio has a service delivery model and we've long been aware in Appalachia that talent is equally distributed but opportunity isn't. And what we found is that through the use of this service delivery model that has been developed in the state of Ohio utilizing infant and early childhood mental health, we have seen some of the disparities or the great differences that are faced here in Appalachia um, really be addressed in ways that may not have originally been what we thought the outcomes would be. Those disparities are overwhelming sometimes to, uh, to consider. And this delivery model has been a major stepping stone to assist in providing opportunity for children and for families and for professionals. And for a region that's historically been exploited um, through the pillaging of natural resources, the impact of negative stereotypes and absentee landowners, the impact of uh, having new opportunities is critical. And so in our time together today, we'll look at the Appalachian region, we'll look at its strengths, we'll look at its challenges, and we'll also do a deep dive into the way Ohio's IECMH service delivery model has created opportunity in new and innovative ways and has helped to mitigate some of those current and persistent disparities. We get a lot of feedback when we talk about the Appalachian region. Folks are often not aware of how encompassing it is. And so we wanted to start with looking at this map that explores the Appalachian region, which actually encompasses 13 states and 420 counties in the Eastern United States. And it's home to the Appalachian mountain range. And the population of Appalachia is approximately 25.7 million. So we're talking about a lot of individuals who are impacted by some of the things that we'll talk about today. This information comes from the US Census data in 2019. 
And we know that that information ebbs and flows. We also want to point out that there are a number of unique strengths in the people of Appalachia. Many are characterized by the history that built this region. The mountains kept many of the people isolated in their regions from the rest of the country and also from the influence of others. And that propelled the Appalachian people to develop a really distinctive culture that is not often found outside. Some of the characteristics that are attributed to the Appalachian culture include things like fundamentalism, isolationism, familiarism, and homogeneity. And these characteristics over time have calcified into stereotypes as what we've seen. And those stereotypes are often perpetuated in the media. And what's interesting about being an individual who was born and raised in Appalachia as both Tammy and I were, is that we are aware of the stereotypes. We live these stereotypes. And yet we see the people of this region remain resilient and proud. In fact, while there are a lot of strengths that encompass the Appalachian region, most often they're promulgated as negative stereotypes. And that has really been the heart of the work that we've done is to say that yes, there are these disparities here. There are socioeconomic challenges. There are challenges that are not faced in other areas. However, there's a lot of beauty and resilience and strength in this region as well. And so as we share these things, we never wanna forget that hope-filled piece that reminds us um, of our own pride of where we grew up and where we now work and we do this important work that we've been honored to do. So when we talk about negative stereotyping, one of the things, uh, and we could talk for days, we only have 50 minutes today, so we're gonna touch on a couple, but the opiate epidemic has disproportionately impacted this area. And four states within the Appalachian region, West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky, have seen the highest rates of drug overdose deaths in the country. And though investigative journalism has revealed that things like Purdue Pharma's intentional failure to educate doctors on the highly addictive nature of OxyContin, many still believe that this, um, this opiate epidemic that has faced our region can be attributed to Appalachians innate or immorality or self-destructiveness as the cause of addiction. And we saw that Purdue Pharma admitted guilt and paid more than $600 million in fines. And some doctors in Appalachia continue to overprescribe pain medication for financial gain. The region continues to suffer. Another example are the boom and bust cycles that have assaulted the Appalachian region for decades. Appalachia is a resource rich area, but it's been ruled by absentee landowners who made millions of dollars from the hard work of local coal miners, only to leave them physically and emotionally broken, often with physical ailments such as black lung, which is a condition that afflicts coal miners after breathing in coal dust. And even though these individuals who toiled underground to retain coal for large companies that they worked for found themselves fighting to obtain the benefits that they were entitled to because of the work that they had done. So as we talk about these things, there's a reason, right? In these 13 states where 25.7 million people are impacted, there have been a lot of systemic issues that are often not looked at, and that was just two. And those systemic issues have really been some of the challenges that have been historically faced and that are faced presently. And just to touch on a little bit, um, some of the additional challenges have been highlighted by school closures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the things that we often find ourselves talking about is the digital gap. It is sometimes very difficult. Um, there is not the same type of internet services and providers that are available in this area that there are in other regions. And as we started looking at information, um, we saw that according to the Population Reference Bureau, 
the share of Appalachian households with a computer device was about five percentage points lower than the national average. So in Appalachian regions, it's about 82% compared to the national region where it's about 87%. And I'm gonna draw your attention to what that looks like in our, um, specifically in our um, little community that we live in in Athens County. You know, so as Ms. Uh, Misty had mentioned, um, Prior to the pandemic, um, this digital divide has been unfortunately very persistent in Appalachia for decades. Um, however, when our students were forced to go into remote learning due to the spread of the virus, um, a lot of attention was placed on it then because um, it was becoming a nationwide issue, right? Students were home, um, they had to have you know, access to this internet, um, to computers, and so what that looks like in our area specifically, I was um, on my way to work one morning, very cold morning. Um, it was in early spring, about a year ago this time, and um, frost on my windshield, frost on the grass, and I pull into the local McDonald's to get me a cup of hot coffee. Um, actually, I'm lying. I don't drink coffee. I'm nervous. I'm um, hot tea. <laughs> I drink hot tea, not hot coffee. Um, but I get I pull in to get me a, a cup of hot coffee because I'm trying to you know break the chill um, from being outside, just stepping outside of my home and getting into my car. And as I pull around uh, to go through the drive through, I see a young man looks like he's probably maybe 12 years old. Um, and he was sitting on the concrete um, sidewalk um, outside of the building with his computer, laptop, whatever the school had provided him with on his lap. Um, my assumption is he was trying to use the internet to begin his homework, begin his classes for the day. Um, he could not go inside the building at that time because um, this is a, uh, we, we were still shut down and the lobby had not been opened. He wasn't able to access the local library at this time because it was like seven o'clock in the morning. And so that's what it looks like um, from our perspective. Um, and again, prior to COVID-19, um, we didn't have uh, a lot of attention shed on this particular um, uh, topic. Um, and we had children at that point in time that, you know, before the pandemic in our area that had been given homework to do um, via the internet, and they weren't able to successfully get this homework um, completed because of lack of, of internet or quality internet. Um, thankfully, we, um, because of this pandemic, um, we have had a, a movement to um, to get something moving in our areas to make sure that our students do have um, equal access. But again, this is something that we have experienced for decades and it took, um, and that this sounds like a Debbie Downer, but it took a pandemic um, for this to be brought to light um, at a state level to say, hey, these kids in Appalachia um, have every right to have um, access to, um, to this quality internet so they too um, can complete their homework assignments. Thanks, Tammy. I know that when we talk about figures and facts and data, there are some folks that really gravitate towards that and can remember that five percentage point disparity. But there are people out there like me who really like to hear what does that look like in the moment? And what that looks like is having children sitting outside of places where Wi-Fi is available so that they can actually access it to do the work that they're able to do. And so those are some of the things that we've seen in our community. Just also pointing out uh, before we move on, the median income in Appalachia, while it is slowly increasing, thankfully, is still nearly 10,000%, I'm sorry, $10,000 lower than the national median of 57,652. And the share of Appalachian residents living below the poverty level exceeded the national average with every age group except for those ages 65 and older. So some of those things that we talked about, the boom and bust cycles of coal mines and the pillaging of resources and the um, opiate epidemic and lack of things like internet access, those things have added to uh, the economic challenges that are faced in the area.
So as we talk about Appalachia in various different settings, one of the things that we often hear from people is, yeah, we're completely familiar with the things that are happening in rural regions. And rural regions absolutely face challenges that more urban areas don't. But rural and Appalachian are often used synonymously. But there are clear and critical differences that we wanna make sure that we highlight today while much of Appalachia is rural, rural areas are not necessarily Appalachian. So when you look for definitions of rural, you often get information that relates it to countryside or living outside of urban areas, or that which is not urban. But we wanna make sure that you leave today with the knowledge that Appalachia is a geographic region covering a huge portion of the Eastern United States. It's home to the Appalachian Mountain Range. And for more clarity, we want you to think back to the map that we just showed with the 13 states included in the Appalachian region. Rural areas actually occur throughout the entire United States, right? You can find rural areas anywhere. You cannot, however, find Appalachian areas everywhere. When strategies and tools are shared, they're identified as being effective often in rural communities, but it doesn't always translate to effectiveness in the Appalachian region because there are distinctive issues that are facing our people. And in this graphic, one of literally hundreds that are available for comparison, you can see that Appalachian rural poverty is significantly higher than for those living in non-Appalachian rural areas. And while this graphic specifically represents poverty, the same disparities are present in the Appalachian region for things like employment, access to high-speed internet, as we discussed, and healthcare. And so simply stated, the Appalachian region has a number of somewhat isolated challenges to overcome that are not necessarily seen in other regions. All right, so that's gonna take us to, um, we're gonna take a look at the key barriers to um, um, our folks in Appalachia having access to mental health, quality mental health treatment. Um, the um, American um, Psychiatric Association has these uh, five barriers that we're gonna take a look at. We'll briefly look at them. Obviously, like Misty said, we don't have a time um, to go into um, a lot of detail about them, but we do know that there are um, these barriers that we were talking about to um, accessing mental health treatment. Um, oftentimes we see um, these barriers occur uh, due to the geographical region um, and the distances between um, cities. Uh, many of our folks, when we talk about rural areas, um, we're talking about areas that um, do not have paved roads. We're talking about areas. Um, I, I want to make note that when we talk about like the geographical region, um, it's kind of like it's layered, right? Because we do have folks who live in areas that there aren't any paved roads. And so we have to take um, seasons into consideration. Um, if you live in an area where you live, um, miles away from the nearest city that has um, your local Walmart or grocery store, um, you're coming into town um, not that often. Um, and a lot of our folks uh, experience um, not just um, uh, just living in those areas, but they, they may not have um, transportation. A lot of individuals that live in our area don't specifically have their own transportation. And then we're talking about areas that, again, um, depending on the season, if it's winter time and we get a six inch, uh, six to eight inch snow and we don't have pavement on the road, we're not going to have um, the city coming out and cleaning off those um, roads that consist of uh, no pavement. And when I say no pavement, I mean dirt and gravel. And so, um, again, this is a barrier as well. Um, we're also, when we're talking about um, it's uh, the distance alone can make it very inconvenient. And then when you pair this with lack of public transportation systems, um, sometimes it just um, feels almost impossible for um, our folks to access this service. 
And then we take a look at there's also an incredible shortage of mental health providers. Sometimes it becomes very overwhelming in the system um, that does provide the service. Um, it makes it very difficult when this happens um, for um, our folks to receive timely care. Um, as Misty had mentioned, you know, um, a lot of our folks, we, we have that uh, um, historical um, fear of the outsider um, and the systems um, sometimes are aligned with this. Um, and then what we see is if we have an individual um, who is seeking out, um, whether it's medical care or mental health care, um, it's hard to seek out help. And so sometimes it can feel shaming. And so if you are someone who's seeking out help, let's say for mental health reasons, and um, you're basically told that you have to be put on a waiting list, what kind of message does that convey, right? Because again, we're talking about individuals who um, haven't always felt that they were valued in their community um, historically. And so to um, reach out for a service and to be told, you know, sorry, we can't really help you right now um, because they're just overwhelmed, we're overwhelmed. Um, that conveys a message again to perhaps I'm not as valuable as somebody else. And so we run into um, that as well. Um, The supply of mental health providers that we have for 100,000 population in the Appalachian region is 35% lower than the national average. And then additionally to that, addition to that, many uh, subregions in Appalachia have even um, a lower supply of mental health providers um, with central and southern Appalachia reporting up to almost 50% lower than what that national number looks like. Appalachians have also faced um, a great deal um, of historical trauma relating to the ex, uh, exploitive nature, um, as Misty had mentioned prior, uh, such as the coal mining and the impacts um, that um, she had discussed earlier from the pharmaceutical companies. And so this long and troubling history, again, has fostered that lingering um, distrust of outsiders, which extends again to many services <clears throat> within the system, and that's including mental health. Um, an additional side effect of this distrust along with the isolation of the area is that strong sense of self-reliance. Um, for many folks, uh, many of us Appalachians, um, seeking help feels very uncomfortable. And then there's the notion that um, one shouldn't really have to uh, depend on or require assistance from the outside, but instead um, rely upon ourselves or upon our family members for that support. Um, in fact, for many, uh, they have seen the impact of the systemic disappointment um, and they prefer just not to get engage in services because of that. Um, and then finally, uh, as with other regions across our nation, there is a stigma that is attached to that mental health, um, to receiving mental health services. That stigma impacts um, those who are directly affected by mental health challenges, but um, it also affects um, the loved ones who are supporting these individuals. Um, we know that researchers have identified three types of stigma. We have public stigma, self-stigma, and institutional stigma. Public stigma involves the negative, involves, I'm sorry, the negative um, or the discriminatory attitudes that others may have about mental illness. Um, of course, self-stigma is going to refer to that negative attitude, um, including that internalized shame that people with mental illness have about their own condition. And then the institutional stigma is, uh, again, that more systemic involving policies of government, uh, private organizations that may intentionally or unintentionally limit um, opportunities um, for people who do suffer with mental illness. An example, uh, some examples would include lower funding for um, mental illness research or um, fewer mental um, health services that are relative to other health care. And so if you take a look at the screen, um, we're gonna take a look at the uh, image of the iceberg. And so um, we're gonna look at the co uh, cultural considerations. So when working in um, the Appalachian regions, um, it is very vital to explore how culture factors, how our values, our beliefs um, can in fact impact individual, individual relationships within the systems. 
In Appalachia, strong family ties are foundational. Um, Appalachia is a kin-based society. Um, relatives are relied upon for advice and for emotional support. Um, we, um, as Appalachians, are more likely to perceive institutions, um, social agencies, and professional helping agents with fear and suspicion. Again, uh, the, the fear of outsiders. Agencies are often staffed or administered by, again, the outsider, who sometimes, unfortunately, are culturally insensitive to the region. So as with uh, most people, in order to engage in services, um, that individual needs to feel that um, respect, right? We need to um, ensure that when we are engaging with um, individuals, um, that we um, begin with that, re that relationship, right? Building that foundation for that safe, trusting, and ongoing relationship. In addition, those of us living and working in Appalachia, we are incredibly aware, again, of those stereotypes that are associated with the region. And so to understand the depth of the cultural considerations um, that must be made, again, we're going to take a look at this image of the cultural iceberg. In nature, only about 10% of an iceberg can be, seen, can be seen above the surface of the body of water. And that's going to represent, we can only see about 10% of an individual's culture as well. What we uh, can see uh, or be thought of as the what, while the 90% that we cannot see can be viewed as the why. So the 10% is what we see or what individuals see, but the 90% is why we see that. Um, and so I was gonna try to make this like a cool TED talk analogy and it's not gonna turn out that way, but I'm gonna do my best to explain this to you the way I understand it. As a child, my mom used to say to me, you cannot judge a book by its cover. Tammy Jo, you cannot judge a book by its cover. As a child, I didn't quite understand what that meant. And I remember um, asking her, um, I thought it meant, you know, you, you have to read the pages before you can judge what that title, what that title says, what that cover says. Um, so as a child, trying to read all of the pages uh, and trying to understand what that cover meant was kind of difficult. That took a lot of reading and I'm not a reader. Uh, but what does that mean? It means uh, you cannot judge a book by its cover, right? You have to open the book. You have to look into the story. You have to read the content. You have to understand the language. You have to learn the language, but you have to understand what that language is. You cannot depend on what that cover looks like. You have to get to know what that story actually says. You have to understand what that content is, right? Um, when you are um, more able and prepared to understand what that content is about, um, that is when um, you're going to be able and ready to make change, right? Um, when you look at the content um, and you read it and you understand the language and you know why the language is the way that it is, um, then that is when um, you're going to change the narrative of what that story might entail. So then we're going to take a look at creating the opportunities while IECMH creates. We've just did a very quick overview of some of the strengths and challenges of the Appalachian region. Now we're going to take a look at examining the ways that the Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health acts as the missing link. Um, we know that Appalachia is often under a very underserved region but it also houses an amazingly strong, resilient, and tenacious culture. In Ohio's Appalachian counties, we um, have seen how the IECMH um, assists in leveling the playing field, but providing readily available access to best practices and resources, um, increasing the confidence and the regional capacity. Um, IECMH consultation has proven uh, to be a catalyst in the creation of strong partnerships while enhancing the skills um, of the valuable adults um, in the lives of the children um, through the services that are provided. And the image on the screen is an image of Lake Hope, uh, Zaleski, Ohio. It's about 20 minutes um, from, from where Misty lives, a little bit farther for, from where I live. Um, but this is the beauty um, of, of the Appalachians. 
Thanks, Tammy. So we're gonna move forward uh, as looking at some of the different pieces here that have kind of inadvertently happened through our IECMH work. So we know as people living in the Appalachian region, again, that talent is equally distributed, opportunity isn't always, right? And so we think about disparities and we think about equity and we think about diversity and we think about all of those pieces. And we always wanna make sure that we're also referencing place, right? Because in situations like we have here in the Appalachian region, um, 32 of Ohio's 88 counties are considered Appalachian. Um, we wanna make sure that we're also indicating that there are these amazing things happening. And yes, we are dedicated to working towards um, equality, we are dedicated towards working with equity and providing the best resources possible. But what we've seen over time, and Tammy and I, as, as I mentioned, have done this work for about eight years. What we've seen over time is this really interesting tie-in with infant and early childhood mental health consultation. So the consultative stance is an element of the IECMH model. And the consultative stance says that how the consultant is, how they demonstrate interest and empathy and respect and understanding is central to successful consultation. And then what's termed a parallel process, the positive experience of the relationship between the effective consultant and the early care ed educator and those that are involved in working with the child influences all other relationships. So this is not a checklist, right? The one thing that always stands out to me when I talk about the consultative stance is this is how someone is, how you are, how empathetic you are, how interested you are, how understanding and how respectful. This is a way of being and this way of being is really central to a relationship model that happens to really nicely align with the values of the Appalachian culture. And so just to take a little bit more of a close look at this, the consultative stance has these elements that were identified as well. And those elements are listed here. And I wanna just touch on each one because I talk, as I talk about it, I want you to think back to some of the examples that we used about the Appalachian region, boom and bust cycle of coal mining, absentee landowners, people making a lot of money off of the people who were working in the region, big pharmaceuticals, and the distress that that's caused, and how these pieces of the consultative stance really align well with the beliefs and the values held really closely in many of the communities that we work in. So it's important to note that the consultant holds the theoretical and the developmental perspective that relationships and the interaction between caregiving adults and children have a primary role in that social emotional development and mental health in young children. The parallel process is when that consultant understands that all relationships influence one another. Avoiding the position of expert, sees the consultant relying on the relationship and a collaborative process in order to build capacity for positive outcomes for children and families. Mutuality of endeavor, where everyone involved with the child is contributing to the process by identifying the concern, mutually sharing perspectives, developing hypotheses, and showing a willingness to participate together in what is best for the child and the family. Understanding another subjective experience. We see the consultant listening to staff and to parents and considering their personal context, their values, their attitudes, their belief systems, their practices. Hearing and listening to personal experiences and histories 
and how these influence perception, relationship, on the job actions and all interactions. When we consider all level of influence, the consultant considers the influence that comes from the organization, from the community, from the family, from those who are working within the systems. When a consultant is able to hear and represent the voices, we see individuals who are eliciting information and hearing voices and listening to perspectives equally especially the child's, and then facilitating cooperation and collaboration. And when a consultant is able to wonder instead of knowing, they avoid that position of expert that we mentioned earlier. They encourage other perspectives. They facilitate a process of understanding that is evolutionary in the, in the relationship. Patients, because my goodness, if you've worked with children and families, you know that's a requirement, right? It is really difficult work and it is certainly challenging, but it is also really, really worth it. And that's why we do it. So with patients, we see consultants who are anticipating the time it takes to really un uncover and um, understand and influence change. And then above all, holding hope. And I think of this as we discuss all those challenges in the Appalachian region, right? There are a lot of them, right? Um, socioeconomic status, lack of resources. There's also this really amazing group of individuals who are talented and brilliant and who want the best things for their home as well. And so just a question of reflection quickly. Just a minute or two. Thinking about those elements of the consultative stance and some of the things that we talked about in the Appalachian community, how can you see the consultative stance complementing the Appalachian region? And you are welcome to pop into the chat box. And I'm gonna just give a moment for folks to think and reflect upon the question. How do the elements of the consultative stands complement the strengths of the Appalachian community? Thank you, Khadija. I really appreciate your comments. Nicole mentioned the focus on relationships and allowing the community to serve as the expert. Absolutely. This is a vital piece of being in an Appalachian region is not coming in with a quote unquote missionary mentality where individuals are coming in and telling you how to fix something or how it should be, but we're truly entering into a reflective and respectful relationship where community members, families are the experts. Thank you. Amy mentioned curiosity and wandering, focusing on the relationships. So vital, Amy, thank you for that. And if things come up for you as we continue, feel free to drop them into the chat box. Tammy and I will keep an eye out in there. Erin mentioned the parallel process, working alongside of individuals. Annie, thank you so much. Having a framework, right, to consider the systemic forces that affect family and child well being. Patience, building relationships and trust, right? That trustworthiness and transparency, Amy. And Linda mentioned collaboration, building something together. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you so much. And again, feel free to continue. If something comes to you, we certainly don't want to cut you off. So you'll see on the screen now, we have the theory of change for IECMH consultation developed by Georgetown, the center of excellence. And what we know is there have been decades of research that indicate the positive impact that IECMHC has for children and for the adults who care for them. 
So this graphic illustrates the characteristics of those involved in consultation, the activities and relationships at the core of consultation, and the direct and indirect effects on outcomes. But what I'd like to do is take a second to break it down just a little bit and look at those direct effects and those indirect effects. So in an underserved, under-resourced area, ECMH is really the missing link. So the consultant is able to level the playing field and help connect best practices and resources where there's previously been a real lack of those things. And so another one of those outcomes is introducing the idea of mental health very early on and working to kind of destigmatize that, normalizing the process. Hopefully that um, we see someday a world where we live in where mental health is just like a well checkup. We're seeing those moves happen and it's really, really exciting. Indirect effects of consultation also show a reduction in disparities. And for Appalachia, that is just as valuable as those direct effects. Reducing disparities in programs, reducing disparities for children and families is critical. And then the upcoming slides, as we kind of finish strong today, we're gonna to look a little bit more closely at what IECMH has done for an underserved area. So you may remember that this is where we started, Ohio's IECMH service delivery model. And the delivery model really encompasses these four, uh, we've referred to them as buckets over the years. Right, you see the Ohio model and then under it, these four different areas. And while each one has a multitude of services held within it, in order to make the connections that we're hoping to make for you, let's broadly look at each one. So when we look at ICMH workforce expansion, we are able to see how important this piece has been by bringing on additional infant and early childhood mental health consultants, we have been able to better meet the needs of children and families across the state. This continues to grow as we move along. There's also a piece uh, here labeled IECMH Training Institute. And so that is what I am honored to be a part of as one of Ohio's seven master trainers. The Training Institute provides a master trainer to each region in Ohio to train professionals in evidence-based practices to best support social emotional needs of children and their caregivers. And for Appalachia, the Training Institute has provided a really great access to free high quality training that's rooted in best practices. And of course, we've kind of moved into the world of Zoom, which has changed a little bit of that regional piece. The Ohio Preschool Expulsion Prevention Partnership, you see listed as well, another one of the buckets, is a free statewide program that aims to reduce the rate of expulsions in preschool age children. This free resource is available for any licensed preschool or family child care provider licensed by the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services or the Ohio Department of Education. And the idea is that an individual will come, a mental health professional will come, a consultant will come into a program and be able to provide support, provide tools and resources for providers on ways to manage challenging behaviors, through observation, modeling, strategies, information, support, and then a link back to additional professional development as needed. And then the last bucket, 
program evaluation, we know it's key, right, for any service delivery system. And Ohio has been collecting extensive data to evaluate programming since the implementation services were provided under the Whole Child Matters grant. And this has been an additional benefit to our Appalachian counties. Uh, the professionals that are working and residing in this region have been able to provide feedback that is directly regarding the delivery service effectiveness and offer suggestions for the work. And so we're really focused on that invest and connect piece, right? And so a lot of times, as we've discussed, the manner that Appalachia is represented in news articles and television programs can be negative. And while stereotypes are pervasive in every culture, we know the overarching stereotypes of Appalachian often show negative themes. And there are economic disparities, there are scarce resources, but there's also an incredible opportunity to change that narrative to override those stereotypes that are out there. And through utilization of infant and early childhood mental health consultation around the state, we're seeing incredible strides for our youngest and our most valuable citizens. Job creation, abundant access to free quality specialized training, an increased number of mental health professionals, destigmatization of mental health services, normalization of those things. With the expansion of IECMH across Ohio, our underserved areas have had the benefit of a service that foundationally aligns with the strong cultural values that are found here. And you'll see on your screen an incredible image of Baroque Lake, which is not too far from where we live as well. As we have just a few minutes left, remembering where we started, thinking of three unique characteristics of Appalachia and three ways that IECMH has reduced Appalachian disparities. And I'm gonna take a look in the chat box. And if there are any questions, please feel free at this point in time to ask those. We would be happy to answer. Misty, you have a really good question from Ava Marie. It's all the way at the bottom. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. That is a great question. Very great question. So there are a lot of different agencies within our area who are looking to do just that. Uh, there are um, those of us who are work within the training world. There is also the Appalachian Children's Coalition. And one of their main goals in their upcoming year is to really look at providing trainers providing people who can offer professional development in this region who were born and raised in this area. And so we have been uh, honored enough to have conversations with many other partners, and that is exactly what we are hoping to do. Very good question. Thank you so much for that. Khadija, thank you. Khadija mentioned that the consultative stance allows us to embody ancient and traditional wisdom and ways, and therefore to respect the varied wisdom and ways of diverse peoples and individual identities. You are so right, Khadija. And as Timmy and I were working on this presentation, that's one of the things that was so great to see is, while it's incredibly impactful and relevant for our Appalachian region, it is also really impactful and relevant to other cultures. Well, Tammy and I would like to thank you guys for spending part of your afternoon with us. It has been an honor and a privilege to do so. There is just about one minute remaining. We really appreciate you and we encourage you to enjoy your afternoon sessions. And again, humbly thank you for the time that you spent with us talking about something that means a lot.